So we have an announcement before our panel start. Introduce yourself. All right. Hello, hi, my name is Laura Sturian and I'm one of the organizers of an excellent film screening which will take place here at MIT on Thursday, April 19th in less than two weeks. Um, uh, and it's a fantastic prize-winning documentary uh, followed by a Skype discussion with one of the key protagonists in the film, Adam Keropian. So this is about the work of Adam Keropian and Virginia Patti. And it's a very edifying and enriching film and very unique and original, so I really encourage you to come. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have some food as well, <laughs> but it's going to be a good event even without the food. Um, so we, I'm going to leave these on the table outside, but we would appreciate it if you could pre-RSVP so we also get a sense of the number of people coming. We'd really appreciate that. So I'll leave these outside and hope to see you there. <laughs> I'm going to make it quick. I know a bunch of you know me. Thank you so much, taking time away from a fascinating, fascinating workshop. Okay, so some of you may know that I've been involved in Turkish-Armenian relations around the Boston area for the past decade, during which I also have observed and admired Lerna and Melissa's work. Um, there's going to be a screening and a discussion about this very subject next Wednesday at the Capitol Theater in Arlington. There's gonna be a lot of food for thought, in addition to normal food. So <laughs> if you can make it, it would be great. And I know there's a lot of other stuff going on, but I just wanted to tell you that it's worth it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, <clears throat> Yes, now. Should I call Sushant? Yeah. Right? Should, should I? Hi, everyone. I am Lisa Gillisarian, and I am the lecturer here at Harvard. Well, not here at, this is MIT, but uh, here in, in the Boston area at Harvard in Armenian language and culture. And I'm here today as the chair of a panel that is so fascinating, and hopefully for you as the audience, you'll be able to ask lots of questions and other things at the end that will edify uh, and, and really, for us, give us the context of what work went into this amazing book project that Lerna and Melissa have, have, have completed. So uh, what I'm going to do today, so first I'm gonna thank Lerna and Melissa for organizing this conference and for bringing us all here together. It's amazing to see a room packed completely. I mean, this is a packed room. So look around and see there's so many people here that are invested in the same things, uh, this, the topics that we're talking about today. These, the collaborative effort, the, this uh, inclusionary effort of this feminist practice that Lerna and Melissa have, um, have shown us in the, their book project. So thank you again, Lerna and Melissa, for organizing the conference and for doing the book project at all. So thank you again. I'm honored to chair this panel of devoted, brilliant, and accomplished translators. As Lerna and Melissa explained, our four panelists today were involved in translating the 12 women that are included in Feminism in Armenian, the book project. And these women here on our panel today are, again, uh, they come from all over. We have women, three women working in uh, American academic institutions and one in Armenia who is going to be Skyping in. I want to just make a little quick note about why translation, it's so important to have this panel on translation today. So talking about translation at all is a feminist project. 
because translators often get relegated to tiny little font on the front page or on the cover page of a translated work. We also know that translated work in general, like for example, in, in America, only 3% of work in published work it has, is a translation in America. So translation in general is an underrepresented topic, it's an underrepresented industry or field of work. And so it's very important that we've got our panelists today talking about their experience of translating and also contextualizing it within a larger feminist framework. So I wanna just point out that just talking about translation at all is a feminist endeavor. And so we're really glad uh, that we are including translators in this work. So we're gonna Shall start. I call yeah. Shushan so that she can hear yes. how you're yes. introducing her? Sure, so we'll start. We're, today's panel is gonna include our four translators and one of them is currently being called. Our four translators today are going to each give us their experience and uh, their answers to a few generative questions that were asked of them. And some of these questions include, how has translating these women energized you? How has it informed your work or your own self-conception? What potential do these texts have? In translation, now that they're gonna be out in the world, so it's where we're you know, amending this archive and we're making it also accessible to a much larger audience by making it on, uh, accessible online. So, and how do these translations fit into your intellectual activism or into your own feminist praxis? How would you situate your work, your own work, in, into or within feminist translation studies? And then also, finally, and this is a question about this project, how do you view the collaborative nature of this project, which is of four translators, it includes the four translators here on our panel, but also the two editors and authors of, of the project themselves, Lerna and Melissa, all women in academia, all Armenian. How would you, you know, how do you view this project, this collaboration? What, is, what has it done for your own work? So these are just some of the generative questions that our panelists might be addressing in their talks today. So we'll go through and each translator will give their experience and answer some of those questions for us. So we'll start with our first panelist, who is Shushan. Can I ask for something? Yeah. Uh, Shushan, can you hear us? <clears throat> yes. Hi, yes. Shushan, we can, can she you. see us? Okay, that's perfect. No? You, uh, yeah. Can you see? You <laughs> just, you are just seeing me. I see the wall. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll change this. That will be better. Okay, so here's our first panelist. It's, uh, her name is Shushan Avagian, and she is Assistant Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences at the American University of Armenia. Can she see us now? Yeah. Hi, Shushan. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank, thank you, Melissa, for making this possible. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to continue uh, introducing you, Shushan, if you don't mind. Ready? Okay, so where she's at the American University of Armenia where she also serves as the coordinator of the Graduate Certificate in Translation Program. She received her PhD in English Studies from Illinois State University with a specialization in Translation Studies and a Graduate Certificate in, um, and a Graduate Certificate, I'm sorry, with a specialization in Translation Studies and a Graduate Certificate in Women's Studies. She has taught courses in comparative literature and translation since 2006. Her articles and translations have appeared in numerous publications, including the Review of Contemporary Fiction, Contemporary Women's Writing, Music and Literature, and Dissidences, Hispanic Journal of Theory and Criticism. She's the translator of Energy of Delusion, Bowstring on the Sim Dissimilarity of the Similar, a Hunt for Optimism and the Hamburg, Hamburg Score by Viktor Shlovsky at the Dalkey Archive, Art and Production by Boris Ar Arvatov on Pluto, and I Want to Live, Poems of Shushani Kurgin Kurginian with Ewa. And I'm, it is my deep pleasure to, uh, in, to introduce Shushan to you, not only on a you know, intellectual lever, level because she's a wonderful scholar and um, a, a wonderful teacher, 
I personally have the experience of having Shushan on my dissertation committee, and she was a great reader for my dissertation on Micheline Markham. So I, let's welcome Shushan to the panel, and we'll hear her talk. Thanks. So you can hear me? Uh, is it okay? We yes? can hear you, yes. Thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Um, it is my greatest pleasure to be here. I wish I was there in person, but this too is a luxury to be able to join you via Skype. So I'm really happy to uh, be on this panel. Um, in fact, it is uh, really an honor to be on this panel with these remarkable stellar women who are doing remarkable work. And I have the privilege of working with um, Diana, Katrian, Sean, so on. Uh, I've been working with her in the in the past, and I'm, I, I am working with her now, and um, Lisa too. So it's it's a great uh, honor to be working with them on this project as well. Um, this is an informal talk for me. We were discussing earlier that this is going to be a workshop, so I haven't really prepared anything on paper. I'm not really reading anything from uh, from a paper. I just have notes, and I'll be. Um, looking down at my notes that will guide me in my uh, talk. Uh, so I might be using some first names because it's informal. Um, Melissa, Lerna, and, um, uh, and um, so, and you might be hearing some traffic from Bahraman Avenue because it's right across <laughs> from, from where I am. Um, so actually I was introduced to this project last year in March when Lerna was in Armenia. Uh, very briefly doing observation, the parliamentary uh, uh, election observations. And when I found out that she was coming to uh, Yerevan, I immediately uh, asked her, Lerna, what are you working on? Uh, why don't you come and uh, do a talk at AUA? I really didn't know at the time that she and Melissa were working on this uh, brilliant um, project. And that's how I learned. I found out about this uh, project, Feminism in Armenian the source book, uh, the web source, and the, all the scholarship that they've been doing uh, via the talk that she gave nearly last year, if I'm not mistaken. It was in March uh, 2017, and uh, we discussed about it, and Levna was, um, and Melissa were uh, really interested in having me as part of this project and invited me to uh, come as a translator and translate several poets, some some of the poems that were going to be featured in the book. Um, they were Sibyl, uh, Elvis Gesaratian, and Anais. Um, being a speaker uh, uh, of Eastern Armenia, it was a great honor to be invited to join in a project uh, that involved Western Armenians. So this was something rather new for me, um, who would be crossing the borders. Uh, of these two, I want to call dialects. They're not really different languages for me, they're dialects. Um, and so I, even though I was heavily, heavily involved in other projects, I was teaching several courses, I, ha I was editing other books, but I immediately realized the importance of this uh, project and I said yes, immediately, I want to be part of this, I want to participate as a translator. Um, <laughs> Because rarely do I participate in projects where I'm not really the decision maker, not the person who chooses what to translate, who's actually commissioned to translate. So I immediately had a trust in um, the sort of vision of these two women, of these two scholars, and, and the scope of the project. And I knew that it was going to be um, carving history, it was going to um, create new scholarship, and so I was very excited to be part of it. Um, there were two other books that came before this project that I thought were extremely important. I saw the continuation of this work, uh, Feminism in Armenian. I don't know if this this title will remain. I haven't really discussed this with Lerna and Melissa, but if the source book is going to be called Feminism in Armenia, I will be referring to it as Feminism in Armenian. But there were there are two books that I think that come before this project and are as important and are sort of like foundations for, for this particular project. And one of them is Victoria Rowe's um, A History of Armenian Women's Writing from 1880 to 1922. This is her the first volume, which uh, I'm hoping that, I'm really hoping that she will continue uh, with this project. But it was published in 2003 and um, featuring uh, six 
really important key figures in Armenian literature um, who are uh, Serpui Dusa, Mariam Khatisyan, Sibyl, um, Mari Belerian, Shushani Kuvinyan, and Zabel Yesayan. At the time, for me, this was revelatory when, when this came out. This was the time when I was actually working on the translation of Shoshana Kurkhinyan's poetry. And I saw that there was a chapter on her. I was absolutely thrilled to see that I was not working in vacuum. It was not a void. There was someone else who was working scholarly, uh, had, had, uh, sort of creating scholarship on Shoshana Kurkhinyan and uh, like-minded women writers. Um, and it was thrilling to know that um, it was not a void. The other book that I think that is a part of this project, that feminism in Armenia is continuing the same trajectory, is Diana de Hovannesian's The Other Voice, which was published by Iowa in 2005. That's literally, it came out a few months before Shoshani Gurgenyan's volume came out. And I was, again, absolutely amazed. It was a surprise to me because I didn't know that something like this was, was being in the process, in the making. And this particular book, and, and I, this is sort of a celebration of Diana de Hovannesian's work and life. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away in March this year. But this was absolutely um, revelatory because it, it included uh, research uh, on women's writing from the 8th century until the present. Um, there are uh, contemporary writers alongside 8th century um, anonymous uh, women writers. Um, so I see Lerna's and Melissa's project as something in between these two uh, because they propose to have um, both scholarly uh, analysis, literary analysis, historical analysis, cultural analysis of these uh, 12 women writers, um, and they also are going to have sample translations in them. So it's a, it's a synthesis of these two books. And so I'm seeing uh, this work as part of a already a tradition um, and a very important tradition that we are all part of now today, which is thrilling. Um, of course, there's also a third book that I could cite, but um, I'm focusing on translation into English. But uh, Lerna's and Melissa's book, their Cry for Justice in Turkish, was maybe perhaps the beginning, the sort of um, embryonic idea, and, and then it's going to expand. So they had a Cry for Justice in Turkish and that focused, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on five writers, and now these five have other seven who joined them and become 12 authors. And I know that um, these 12 are only um, scratching the surface. There's, there are more writers that we're going to soon find out about, thanks to this work that Melissa and Lerna are uh, doing. Um, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about um, um, feminist approach, um, my own feminist approach, and uh, what what entails how I understand um, approaching translation via a feminist um, lens or a feminist um, perspective or practice um, or theory. Uh, basically, just as any other feminist thought, um, it means to question um, your position, your situation as a translator, as an editor, as an author, as someone who's working with language, someone who has to absolutely question the language itself in which one operates and functions. In this case, both the language for which we're translating um, and the target language and the target culture, in this case English, uh, which comes with a lot of um, history and traditions and, and norms and canons and ideologies and lots of isms. Um, of course, it is important to sort of uh, question your situation in terms of class and your, your situatedness in terms of gender, your situatedness in terms of race, my situation of, of, of working and operating and thinking in Eastern Armenian, but translating from Western Armenian into a foreign language, English language. So all of these things, they're very complicated. Being aware of these things, questioning um, your posi positionality, uh, not allowing for these things to go unseen, unreckoned with, uh, unreflected, because that's what feminist thought is. Feminist thought is being reflective, 
uh, being responsive, being ethical, being uh, highly uh, sort of um, um, uh, aware of your own choices in a sense, right? Um, so I would like to read Trin Minha's, just one or two sentences from Trin Minha's celebrated book, Woman, Native Other, where she is discussing, this is from the third chapter, um, she is crit critiquing anthropology and how anthropology uses, um, manipulates language, uh, instrumentalizes language without really critically looking at language uh, and the power dynamics that language has and how language can colonize and how uh, it works invisibly, operates invisibly in culture. She says, anthropology as a semiology should itself be treated in semiological terms, science. It should situate its position and function in the system of meaning or in other words, explicitly assume a critical responsibility towards its own discourse, exposing its status as inheritor of the very system of signs it sets out to question, disturb, and shatter. Very few anthropological writings, however, maintain a critical language and even fewer carry within themselves a critique of their language. As the version of the colonizer's ability to represent colonized cultures, albeit in interpretation rather than in direct observation, can only radically challenge the established power relations when it carries with it a tightly critical relation with the colonizer's most confident characteristic discourses. In other words, what Trin Minh Ha is, is trying to say, and I see as the translation component in anthropology uh, playing a, a really dominant role, uh, translation has an interpretation and interpreting has always been uh, going hand in hand with anthropology. And uh, very often translators have been viewed and associated with anthropologists um, uh, doing some kind of anthropological work where you're representing a culture, where you're studying a community, where you're speaking for that community. And very often um, these kinds of projects uh, uh, where Armenian literature has been represented by Alice Blackstone Blackwell or uh, um, various other travelers who have been representing Armenians uh, have completely sort of disregarded the dynamics, the relationship between these two cultures, the language, their own language, the way that they use, a very racialized language that they use, very sexualized language that they use, that, that's gone completely uncritically, sort of invisibly uh, passed on, passed down. Uh, but that had a very important impact on the readers. So um, uh, the other uh, aspect, uh, and this is from Lawrence Venuti. Lawrence Venuti is a um, translation studies scholar and a translator himself who's actually really revolutionized the way that Anglo-Americans have, uh, have um, used, practiced translation. And he describes the translator's um, dynamic work as being um, invisible, as in the translator has always had throughout the history of English language, the translator has always been invisible. And um, all of the different kinds of power dynamics have been completely rendered invisible. And he says that's really um, very um, critical because we don't really get to see how the power relations operate. And he says the translator's invisibility is symptomatic of a complacency in Anglo-American relations with cultural others, a complacency that can be described without too much exaggeration as imperialistic abroad and xenophobic at home. In other words, um, excessive domestication, uh, excessive naturalization, rationalization, all of these things that are uh, key and, uh, and invisible uh, forces that operate in the language itself um, have been uh, instrumentalized for various nefarious purposes, nefarious Tony Morrison's term, uh, various uh, purposes. And so, um, for example, we, we have, I'll just bring two examples of uh, Edward Fitzgerald's uh, project with Omar Khayyam's, uh, the translation of Omar Khayyam's poetry. This was in the 18th 1800s, 1860s, uh, the British poet 
and now I'll be talking about poets and how poets, poets who didn't know the language, who didn't know Farsi, Edward Fitzgerald claims that supposedly he learned Farsi in overnight, uh, worked with anthropologists or sociologists or orientalists, in this case with the orientalist E.B. Cowell, who discovered Omar Khayyam and passed it on, pitched it to Fitzgerald, who had absolutely no knowledge of the, 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 the culture itself, where Khayyam is coming from, etc., etc., and, and translating volumes of Omar Khayyam's work, signing his name Fitz Omar, supposedly, and representing Omar Khayyam in, in uh, ridiculous ways. Actually, there's no Omar Khayyam in these poems. There's just Fitzgerald in these poems. Um, it, it's his own poetry, uh, pseudo-translated and uh, represented as translations. For what purposes? Their whole sort of, I'm not going to delve into that. Um, the other example, and this is the famous Ezra Pound, uh, Ezra Pound's project of translating Chinese classical poetry, cafe, and he didn't know Chinese. He, he basically um, referred to, he used uh, Ernest Fenelosa's research um, and Fenelosa's notes on these uh, poems. And they were just notes, annotations, <laughs> they're not po poetry. And Ezra Pound turns that, translates it into, into poetry. Uh, both in these cases, Ezra Pound is represented as the translator Fitzgerald is represented on the cover as the translator. So that's problematic. And this is the history. This is the history of translation that comes along uh, to us. And we, we, we're in inheriting it as translators. We're operating in that same sort of um, um, milieu and that same discourse. And uh, Diana de Hovanistian was part of that discourse. Um, Diana de Hovanesan's poetry is amazing. I love her poetry, but when, when I actually delve and start comparing and looking at the originals and the translations, I see that uh, here comes that same sort of logic that stand, the poet stands alone, the translator is rendered invisible, the translator's work is not really that important, the labor of the translator is rendered lesser, less it, it, sort of not important at all, and the poet stands out, and the poet's originality, creativity is lauded and acclaimed, and uh, 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 and so here we have this dynamic of originality versus versus uh, supposedly non-originality, but we all know that tran a translator must have originality and creativity to approach translation. Okay, so I don't know if this is, uh, uh, this is probably a lot. I don't really <laughs> want to confuse you with theory of translation, but I think I would like to mention that it is very important to me as a translator and also as an editor, because currently I am editing a volume of translations uh, from English into Armenian. It is very important to make these relations, these associations, these negotiations visible. The relationship between the editor and the author. How are these works selected and chosen? How uh, how are these pieces translated? How are they edited? How do they reach the reader? Um, what kinds of notes and footnotes appear in the book? What kinds of prefaces and afterwards? Right. So all of these things are are important. How how does the editor work with the translators? Um, with the translator. Do you dis discuss and negotiate? Do you, do you use a lot of time? You, you, lo you lose a lot of time. Is it worth? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are questions that we, we have to reckon with. And I would highly recommend in this particular case, I suggest that we should have a translator's note or a translator's some, some sort of preface or an introduction where the translators have a say in what was their approach, what was their way of, of approaching these texts, and what was their sort of input, what was their experience when translating these particular works, and making their relationship to the text visible, transparent. Um, one really important thing that I discovered uh, during the, this, uh, this project translating was, uh, and I'll just talk about this one particular poem, Anais's poem, Wedding. Um, fascinating, because as soon as I read it, I immediately thought of Shoshani Kurkinyan's poem, Sold. 
both of these poems, Shoshani Gurgenyan's poem was written in 1907. Uh, Anais's poem came two years later, Wedding was published in 1909. Uh, both of them deal with uh, the topic of uh, a young girl being married off to a much older man. Um, I suppose this was a really sort of shocking and, and a sort of very current issue that both of these uh, writers addressed. I don't know if Anais had the chance of reading Gurgignan's poem. Uh, Gurgignan's poem was not in her first volume, Asha Lucy Rovangener, The Ringing of Dawn. It was not in, included in, in that book, so it wasn't really published. So I really don't know if Anais knew about Sold. But um, the, the theme, the subject matter is treated very differently, but in a very sort of compassionate and a very sort of radical manner. Um, and I, uh, I'll, I'll talk about sold first. Sold is sort of des describing and discussing a young girl who, who's sort of taken to the church and uh, sold off, and, and, and she's sold into slavery. Where, where else are you sold into? You're sold into slavery, the slavery of marriage. And, um, and, and the, end of the, uh, the end of the poem is very typical of Gurgenian, it's very ironic. The Gurgenian, or the speaker, sees the, the bride, the girl bride much later, who's come to the church, the same institution, to the same sort of uh, place that legitimized her sales, her her, her um, bill of sale, and she is trying to co-opt the saints in a sense. She's trying to, she's praying, she's co-opting the saints to help her produce no more, as in to give birth no more, to produce no more for the for the institution of marriage. The slave does not want to produce anymore, and so she's praying uh, to the stone to the saints. Uh, it's ironic because at the same time she's coming to the same institution. She has nowhere else to go. She's using the same language. She's she's trapped in the same sort of in a in a system, and she does not see where else she can go. She's going back to the same sort of um, place that legitimized her state. Uh, Shushan, sorry to interrupt. I, this is a fascinating, fa it's Lisa, by the way. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion of the two, those two poems that you're comparing, but actually we're just running out of time. So if, if you could, w maybe we, at the end of the panel, someone can ask a question about the, the two poems. It might be a good chance for us to start discussion there. Yeah, thank, thank you, Shushan, I appreciate it. And actually, that's a good place to stop just because I think uh, your work uh, and what you've been talking about has a, has a lot to, um, in, in terms of other work that's happening with feminist, feminist translation studies like Emily Watson's translation of the Odyssey and her use of different words when describing those servant girls. And uh, I think your work is doing similar, uh, your translation work is doing similar uh, reinterpretation of words that we can use for uh, for these kinds of uh, issues. But in any case, thanks again, Shushan. Uh, we're going to go on to our thank you. <laughs> thanks. Okay, great. So we're going to go on to our next speaker, and our next speaker speaker is Maral Akhtokmakian. Maral Akhtokmakian is currently a Manukian postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan's Armenian Studies program. She received her bachelor's in English language and literature from Istanbul University. She received her master's with her thesis on the common palimpsestic female literary style and discourse in the works of Surpahi Dusap and Charlotte Brontë. In 2016, she earned her PhD in Western Languages and Literature at Borazici <laughs> University with a special focus on the biopolitical representations in the Western Armenian literature as well as in the works from <coughs> Western literatures. After her first translation appeared in Melissa Bilal and Lerna Ekmekciolu's co-edited book, A Cry for Justice, Five Armenian Feminist Writers from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic, she worked at Aras Publishing House in Istanbul as an editor and a translator of Armenian literary works for several years. So let's all uh, give Maral a warm welcome. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for this great introduction. Uh, thank you, Lerna and Melissa, for really organizing this workshop, for bringing all of us together in this event, and also, and more importantly, for allowing us to be part of this project. Because it's really, uh, I, I strongly believe that um, it's just a beginning, and it's going to be a wonderful kind of, it's going to create a wonderful originary moment in feminist translation studies, in Armenian feminist studies. And uh, thank you for every, every and each one of you for coming and for listening to all of us. So this is not going to be an informal talk like Shushan's, but I'll be kind of developing what he clearly introduced in the first place. So I hope you're ready to follow my topic. Okay. Okay. So today, I'd like to lead you first to a more conceptual or theoretical level within the question of translation, and then bring you back to the practice of translating our texts and try to show you how much of the conceptual analysis can affect the task and definition of feminist translation studies. The question of sovereignty, one of the issues that I've been working mainly through Western Armenian literature started to shape up more and more my approach towards feminist translation studies as well. So rather than the category of the universal that the feminist studies usually prefer to struggle with, I grew more or less this tendency to build a critical relationship between sovereignty and feminist translation. So basically in three parts, I would like to draw your attention the following claims and briefly open up each one of these three steps. Number one, following thinkers such as Benjamin Spivak, Lyotard, and Derrida, who mainly brought in, brought in the philosophical or conceptual roots of translation. I will not repeat that translation is a political or even political ethical act. It's already been said, I know. But rather uh, propose that translation is intrins intrinsically related to the idea of forming a sovereignty over the original text and the translated text and the writer and his her originary sovereignty and, and therefore translation is always a matter of sovereignty both in theory and practice. Number two, that feminist translation studies is no exception to the risks of sovereignty with a but uh, that it can become a field that is able to reconfigure the definition of sovereign and sovereignty of not one, just one language, but of languages in the most unique and constructive way. And this can, in turn, make it to forge a future not only for feminist theory in particular, but also for the notion of the political in general. So number three, I will try to give you some examples of translations from a few texts of our project, which can better exemplify the ways in which sovereignty is the permanent task of the translators as the rewriters of the original text. So here we go. Let me begin by thinking the classical meaning of sovereignty. In its historical sequence, it denotes to God, the king or the majesty, absolute power, his supremacy, the sense of divinity, standing upright with the absolute sense of magnitude and highness. The question of the sovereign has such a fundamental place in contemporary political philosophy, from Jacques Derrida to Georgia George Agamben, who put their ways of thinking into conversation with their predecessors, such as Hobbes and his Leviathan, and offer such challenging attempts of reading the question, this question in all possible forms of redoing or undoing the concept of the sovereign with its political, theological, and ethical foundations. But if I should briefly, um, give a definition. The most common definition today is Otto Karl Schmidt, the German political philosopher, thinker, and he describes the sovereign as, quote unquote, the one who decides on the state of exception. That is, the sovereign is the one who decides who will be included or excluded within the law. So sovereign is the figure who, who, is, who always comes as holding the right to suspend the law. And how about the translator? Can translator be seen as a sovereign figure? Can the translator or the, and the translation be considered within a sovereign economy, while the original text and its order are already, presumably, synonymous with that state of supreme power? 
It is obvious that translation is not simply a matter of transference between languages, nor is the translator a simple figure who passively mediates between two linguistic mediums. Uh, the translator always emerges as someone who will decide on what to include or exclude, as already mentioned for several times now, um, in the target language, and it is sovereign in the sense that she has the right to rewrite the original text and claim a sovereign gesture next to, and sometimes over, the author herself by bringing, quote unquote, security measures and normative structures. And before ending this general outline of the concept itself, I should also note that any claim of sovereignty over the text is not solidly a one-time only intervention, but part of a complex and ongoing process of translating practices, producing more and more sovereign gestures and wills through decisions. Um, as you all know, the full authority, or I should say sovereignty, of the writer is followed by a series of sovereign moments, starting with the decision of an editor, publishing house, or the marketplace in general, to translate or choose this and not any other work for publication. Or here, there are other common aspects which I can only name in passing, such as standard translations, always denoting a powerful stance of keeping and controlling the meaning in translation, or translation as a social practice, controlling the labor power relations, etc. So along with the indubitable sovereignty of our 12 feminist Armenian women writers, first Lerna and Melissa, and then each of us who collaborated with them as translators are the new, newly emerging sovereign faces within this project. From the very choices made for using certain texts and not others to the actual work of translating them. And here I also want to, uh, it's, it's, it's also worth mentioning the notes in the margins uh, in our copies of original text. This is wonderful. We have notes in three languages sometimes, like this one. Uh, it says in Turkish, th could this uh, part be included? <laughs> or here, this is my favorite, Zari makes it happen. Which one of you wrote this? Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one, my guess. Zari makes it happen, include in the book. <laughs> and another Turkish one, perhaps uh, up until now can be translated or put in the website. And here, uh, is it possible to include this one? Because here Bari talks about Tashnak to tune itself. So these are, <laughs> you know. So, so part two. Now, uh, we have to really think about the sovereignty in um, feminist translation studies and Armenian feminist writers. We know that translation studies have so far emerged out of this reaction against the sovereign characteristic of a translator <coughs> who reduces the meaning into something else for the purpose of making it suitable to the target readership. And we also know that critical thoughts such as postcolonial critic itself gained so much importance and helped translation studies build no, new ways of thinking, focusing on the maintenance of the difference in translations. However, the critical relation between the translator and the sovereign has not yet been scrutinized enough. Instead, uh, feminist translation studies essentially posits its objective uh, against the category of the universal, and therefore the main argument revolving around the paradigm of the universal does lead no further than, quote unquote, intervening in the hegemonic universals with their feminist own situated universals. <coughs> My aim here is not simply to identify the reproducible gestures of authority within translation studies, but also and more significantly try to articulate the ways in which political sovereignty and feminist translation studies can alter each other in the most revolutionary fashion and open up new avenues for thinking in favor of both fields. Among its objectives, FTS primarily aims to create awareness increase women's visibility, eradicate sexism, producing non-sexist texts, rewrite his story or write her story, contract and change patriarchal languages, or as Goda, one of the scholars contributing to the field, terms it, woman handling the texts. <laughs> but how can we really actualize the task of feminist translation studies? 
And how about the same old thread of sovereignty that can endanger the feminist translator herself, as she might be likely to end up with claiming a right over the text in a manner of silencing the text and the other with her supremacy, I mean intentionally or not unintentionally. With the danger always at stake, feminist translation studies, both with its theoretical and practical premises, can restore the notion of sovereignty by place, placing one majestic gesture above another, by showing the ongoing process between languages and writers, the translator who rewrites the text in solidarity with the writer. In doing so, the meaning of sovereignty in its totality collapses and is replaced by the ongoing coexistence of multiple forms of sovereign gestures and moves. So the striking point here, point here is that sovereignty is not essentially a thing that we should forsake. It is one of the fundamental and inevitable conditions of existence, and fields such as translation studies can well help us evolve into more constructive economy. An economy here is important because in a sense that we have to find a space where we can move certain concepts, shape them up by destructuring them. We can bring them from their homes, oikos, the root of economy, and ho the, the, the very word, original word in Greek, and replace and provide them with newer ones. In the very medium of translation, literally translation as designating a new space, language, to write, articulate something in a different language, we bring a presumably duplicate form, shadow, copy, imitation, but new special awareness and alliance or non-alliance with the sister text. Um, so in part three, uh, I'll just try to offer you a number of examples that point to different aspects of handling with sovereign moments. I'd like to begin with mentioning some of the most general issues. The first one is the question of providing footnotes, as Shushan already mentioned. All footnotes in the translated text in general can also be read as the authorial interventions of the translator editor. With its subject matter and its content, all footnotes are closely related to the mode of sovereignty we assume as translators or editors. It is closely related to the limits of knowledge and controlling the information, and translators write over the selectivity of the knowledge is always at stake, facing up with an epistemologic violence of what to include and what not that she can cause. Under the hands of a standard translator, the footnote can turn into the space of the camp, a space where the translator either puts the original text or some part from the text into the exilic side of the footnote or give some supplementary information on the subject matter. In any case, footnote as the object that is reigned by the control and management of the translator serves for normativity. Now I'd like to move on to common problematics of our text in particular, though we do not um, have clear answers for this yet. Still, I wanna show you the potentiality of sovereign will while we are still in the process of making our final decisions. And these examples, I should also note, that should be seen both as examples of our ways of feminist praxis and also the challenges within our feminist translation studies, which keep uh, the song single, not, not single sovereignty, but the, the multiple forms of sovereignty is at stake. So another of our common major problems is about the translation of certain words that have commonly used by most of our writers, these words being gin or high gin, jorovurt, Ser and ask, hyrenic, and with this, within this category of the common words, there's also this term worth mentioning, chesoktun. These are the most um, general and common, commonly used ones. So a general question for all of them would be, should we translate them or leave them as they are and indicate them only in the footnotes? Uh, which I already mentioned is a gesture of bracketing, putting it in, on exile excluding it for the purpose of bringing a smoother language in the native English, for the native English readership, or include them in parentheses in the text itself, or more radically, give them in italics with an English explanation and parentheses instead. Each of these decisions would lead us to a state of sovereignty, different versions, either in the most traditional or restructured sense of the word. 
So I want to, um, I'd love to talk more on two cases on the process of translating Kalantar and Kalem Karyan into English, one of our writers. But to keep it short and simple for this session, I should only uh, say that the following works I'm focusing on are even before their translations closely engaged with the biopolitical idea of management and administ administration of human life, and not just their actual translations, but the translatabilities of these texts, their contents, are further problematized by opening the level of translators' sovereign will uh, to manage the text through a ser series of de decisions. So, <clears throat> Kalantar's prison memoir, serialized in Haigin, is unique in bringing the politically closed and exclusionary space of the prison, together with the reality of coexistence of women from different ethnic and national backgrounds. Kalantar, the writer, allows those Turkish women, prisoners, speak for themselves in their own languages, and thus she uses the style of armeno turkish The Turkish translations of these memoirs in this respect would, would hardly be challenging. Those armeno turkish remarks would be italicized to indicate their original status in the source text. But its translation to any other language, as in the case of English, is not just a problem of transparency of meaning, but the major ethical political problem that, are, that we are faced with. Kalantar, apart from her own personal experience of imprisonment and detailed description of daily life in prison, such as the rivalry between those non-Armenian females, the rivalry almost to the point of the survival of the fittest, she also presents a plethora of vocabulary related to prison life, female prisoners' world, and society. First, we are introduced several women prisoners from different ethnic backgrounds, like Fatma the Arab, Ferida the refugee, Nuria the Kurd, Atiya the Persian, Sinem the Kurd. To some extent, the space of the prison ironically represents the multi-ethnic structure of the Ottoman context. Yet we see how that coexistence is frequently ruptured by, by the war for authority and sovereignty among female prisoners, society, especially through Kalantar's portrayal of the rivalry between Ati and Sine. Secondly, we encounter staff members other than the guardians, like Meidanje and Kolju, or locations such as Kalem Odası, Misafirane, Mehterane, or Turkish words, Kismet, Kibar, Minder, Serseri, Keyf, Yazma, Entari, Taht, Surme, Çarşaf, Büyü, Bela, and it's, it's really hard to translate them. Uh, and these partly uh, form the translatability, the, that, that whole issue itself. And the song Çiftetelli, uh, and th there are lots of others that uh, I think I should skip. So. There's this juxtaposition of two uh, sentences that I want to draw your attention to. Just, okay, yeah. Um, these are the words uh, uttered by, the first one is um, told by a prisoner who's informing Kalantar that her mother is here to visit her daughter. And the other one is um, articulated by Kalantar's mother herself. So. It's so striking to see the momentary existence and solidarity of female languages. Each party recognizes the other female in their use of, use of words. Um, so this is another moment when we should not pull a face and apply a sovereign translator's normative regime. Leaving them as they are will not only create a dialogic and inclusive space of solidarity, quote unquote, but also a non-sovereign gesture in the, run, in the recognition of the other. Um, in uh, Kalem, Kar Kalem Karyan's case, uh, this is from one of her works entitled To My Grandson. Kalem Karyan narrates an event that she lived through during the aftermath uh, of 1915 when the special maternity wards were established for the women who were raped and were expecting babies. And Lerna has a beautiful article on this, uh, Climate for Abduction and Climate for Redemption. And there she already discusses the polar sides of politics imposed upon the management of female bodies. But here I want to mention that piece under the light of translation studies. In this particular story, Kalem Karyan writes for her grandson, thinking that when he gets older, he must know the true conditions and circumstances 
Armenian community had to endure, so Kalem Karyan tells the story of a young Armenian woman who was raped during the genocide, and she demanded Kalem Karyan's help to get an abortion. Kalem Karyan refused to help her in having an abortion, but instead did her best to take care of this girl too, just as hundreds of similar cases were taken care of in the special uh, maternity wards established under the supervision of the patriarchate. In the, event, in the end, the victim girl gives birth to a baby boy and commits suicide in the hospital. So among many other significant war choices in this sentence, we see that uh, it's a critical one that is, that, that is especially worth mentioning. Guzer Ambachar Vakchandal Anor Gyankin. So, um, I, in English translation, I approved and loved Jennifer's decision to translate it in this way and not use absolutely for um, Ambachar. Uh, Kalem Karyan uh, must have chosen this word for a purpose. She did not use Ambayman or Patsar Tsagaves. So Jennifer did not prefer to translate it as absolutely, uh, but say decisively, this decisive, sorry. So the story in general is unique in terms of bringing multiple forms of sovereign claims, the older Kalem Karyan of the victim girl who's raped and wants to get an abortion, and remembering Spivak's argument that translation is a process of reading, we as translator of our feminist texts are burdened with the task of reading them genuinely and correctly and with justice. So one of the reasons that I love this piece is because Kalem Karyan is problematically presenting dual forces of sovereignty that are conflict with each other. The whole story, the narrative, the content, get even more striking as we realize through translation that each claim for sovereignty marks a moment for decision, or better put, a moment for the right to decide. On the one hand, Kalem Karyan, the relief worker, is so decisive about not letting the victim girl have her own line and sovereign claim, and by that decision, her relief work becomes part of the biopolitical agenda of the patriarchate and the society itself. On the other hand, by writing the event Kalem Karyan the Older and the verse to vindicate her failure as a sovereign agent. As for the victim girl, she is left with the possibility of ending her life. The only possible decision over her life comes in the form of ending it. And us, the community of translators can show a moment of multiple forms and of consisting coexisting sovereign claims, which is so unique and brand new, like this project of ours. Thank you. Shinora Gayam. Thank you, Maral. So uh, next we have Jennifer Manukian, who is going to be joining us through Skype. Actually, and we will first watch her presentation rather than Skype. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, so we're actually going to watch Jennifer's presentation through Skype. And if we're ready, I will introduce her. Unless, does she have an introduction? No. OK, OK. So Jennifer Manukian is a doctoral student in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a literary translator from Western Armenian. She received her master's degree from the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University, and her bachelor's degree from the Department of French at Rutgers University. Her book-length translations include The Gardens of Silidar by Azabel Yesayan, and the candidate by Zare Vorfuni. So we're going to watch her presentation, and then will we get a, maybe a chance for her to speak later? Uh, yeah. Okay, so great. So let's watch Jennifer's uh, presentation now. I'm very sorry to be missing the, the workshop this weekend, but some plane trouble has, has kept me in LA. Today I'm going to be uh, talking to you about gender and the politics of Armenian translation. There persists a stubborn view that the best translation is an unbiased translation, that the best translator is an invisible one. But unbiased translation, like unbiased historiography, is of course an impossible feat. 
because before a translation reaches the reader, every word, every idea is filtered through the mind of a human being with his or her own personal philosophies. But this fact doesn't need to be seen as an unfortunate downside of the craft, because with it, these individual philosophies have the potential to enrich the translation landscape. My paper today will focus on a philosophy that colors every one of my own translations by virtue of its constant presence in my own thinking. That is to say, feminism and the politics of gender. In the next 20 minutes, I'll look at two phases of the translation process in which translators have the opportunity to let their feminist philosophies influence their work. First, in the kinds of texts they decide to translate, and second, in the small details of the translation process. Before we get into the two phases, though, I'd first like to take a brief look at the state of translated women writers in the US publishing industry and at the state of Armenian women writers in translation. According to 3%, a platform affiliated with the University of Rochester that tracks literary translations into English, less than one third of translations published between 2008 and 2018 were written by women. The situation for translated literature by Armenian women is at once more dire and more hopeful. Despite a large corpus of writing spanning period and genre, only six books by Armenian women have ever been published in English translation. What is hopeful is that in recent years, we've begun to make up for lost time. You can see here that for the most part, these translations have been published in the past two decades, thanks in large part to the efforts of the New England chapter of the Armenian International Women's Association, which commissioned four of these six translations, the ones start here. But this particular collection of translations also has its dangers. You can see that one woman towers <laughs> above the rest. <laughs> At first glance, one may even be led to believe that she's the only woman to ever have written anything of substance in Armenian, a misleading assumption that this anthology implicitly seeks to correct. Yes, Sion does have a nice, hefty section that Melissa and Lena did a great job curating to include writings from various periods in her life. But in the book, she's cut down to size when put alongside her equally prolific, equally incisive, and equally, equally forthright contemporaries. Okay, how can a translator assert a feminist philosophy at the first stage of translation when deciding on which text to translate? The simple answer is by choosing to consider the work of women writers. At this stage, translators from Armenian have a great deal of choice in selecting their next projects because there are so many foundational texts that have yet to be touched by translators. With respect to the Armenian literary tradition, in which women have only rarely broken into the canon or even into general literary consciousness, choosing to translate women is easier said than done. The choice requires a significant amount of research on the part of the translator to first dig and uncover Armenian women writers of the past and then identify texts worthy of translation. One of the virtues of our anthology is that it will go a long way in helping translators overcome this initial obstacle by introducing them to noteworthy yet understudied writers in need of their attention and care. Similarly, translators can also keep their ears attuned to instances where books and authors are mentioned and superficially discussed without having actually been read. This is where they can identify a need, swoop in, and get to work on creating a canon of Armenian women's writing and translation, one book at a time. One of the most exciting aspects of this kind of work is that through translation, talented women writers who were overlooked in their lifetimes can have the chance to be read and examined and ultimately gain the respect that they were denied years ago. I should mention that I'm deliberately not saying that this is a task reserved for women translators because I don't believe that translation needs to be a separatist feminist act. Both men and women translators can work in tandem in pursuit of creating this canon of Armenian women's literature. All that should be required of both sexes is a respect for the writer and for the historical or literary significance of her work. 
Over the year and a half I've been working on this project, I've had three otherwise smart, knowledgeable people intimate that I was wasting my time translating second-rate writers. <coughs> when pushed a little harder, it came to light that they had never actually read these writers, <laughs> but were working off of rumors they had heard about them. These are not the people we need as translators. People are <laughs> and they're already prejudiced against her. Well, we do not need people who will take an I know best approach to the text, like the infamous example of Howard M. Parshley, who in cahoots with his publisher, Alfred A. Knopf, excised between 10 and 15% of Simone de Beauvoir's work in the 1952 English translation of The Second Sex. Among the sections they chose to omit, without any mention of the omission anywhere in the translation, were almost all references to socialist feminism, a long section on the struggle for women's rights in England, and the names and acts of 78 significant women in history. The kinds of translators we do need are the antithesis of these people, and we don't need to look too hard to find them in Armenian history. Today, we may tend to look back and assume that men were resistant to women's intellectual production or participation in the public sphere. There was certainly, this was certainly true to a certain extent. In the anthology, three of the writers described clashes with Krikor Zohrab in particular. But there were also examples of intellectual friendships between men and women writers. These men were advocates for their female counterparts and tried to temper the social prejudice their friends faced as best they could. My favorite example is the friendship between Sir Pridusop and Krikor Chilingirian, a Smyrnin lawyer by day, writer and translator by night, known in particular for his translation of Les Miserables. A defender of women's education and advancement in his own writing, he found a kindred spirit in Dusop and made use of his connections with the Armenian press in Smyrna and Istanbul writing letters to the editors of these papers on behalf of Dusop, praising her work, and sometimes even translating it from French in an attempt to make sure that she received the attention she deserved from Armenians. This is an excerpt from one of the cover letters he wrote in, 19, uh, in 1882 to Matthias Mamourian, the editor of the newspaper Aurelian Mamour. Quote, if the esteemed writer were to say that she lacked confidence in her intellectual abilities. It would only be a sign of modesty and nothing else. Her work is a tapestry of learned reflections and astute insights, which flow logically and cohesively, neatly and smoothly, and capture the earnest attention of readers. This is just one of many glowing passages from Chilingirian's cover letters, which were often published alongside Dusab's articles in the press. Okay, once a translator has decided to devote his or her energies to translating the work of women writers, how does a feminist philosophy or gender consciousness manifest itself in the actual details of translation? Since so much of the translation process is interpretation, the craft leaves ample room for the pensions and biases of the translator to surface in a translation, often unbeknownst to a monolingual reader and often only becoming apparent upon retranslation. One such case has received a lot of attention in the press over the past few months. Late last year, Emily Wilson, a professor of classics at the University of Pennsylvania, published her translation of Homer's The Odyssey. Though the book has been translated countless times, Wilson was the first woman to publish a translation of the classic text and what she found upon comparing her translation to others shocked her. Quote, many translations import misogynistic language where it isn't there in the Greek, she writes. In one particular passage, she found these words used to describe palace women about to be executed. After all these epithets, you might ask how Wilson chose to translate this phrase. As girls, pure and simple. Since all that exists in the Greek original, she writes, is the feminine definite article. <laughs> this harsh language, she argues, just goes to show the, quote, misogynistic, the misogynistic agenda of the other translators and their own interpretation of how women should be defined, end quote. 
The situation can grow even more complicated when translating from a genderless language like Armenian mm -hmm. into a language where gender is marked, like English. While straightforward and inclusive for Armenian writers, the grammatical absence of gender in Armenian has the potential to create ambiguity for the translator, leaving ample room for a gendered or non-gendered interpretation to make its way into the translation. Take, for example, a passage from Yelbis Kesaratsyan's 1862 editorial, Implementing Rights is Not a Brazen Act, published in the first issue of her journal, Guitar. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the bolded words in the Armenian, Mart, and its various iterations, can be understood both as gendered, man, or as genderless, person, individual, or human. One of the upsides and downsides of translating long dead writers is that you can't ask them what they meant by a word. <laughs> the burden of interpretation, therefore, rests solely on the translator. If this same passage had been translated a century ago, before inclusivity of language had become part of public consciousness to a certain extent, it would not have been surprising to see a translator translate all three of these instances as man in the dated, generic sense of the word. The case of Mart appears throughout the book in almost all the authors I translated for this anthology. And in each case, I always opted to retain the genderlessness of the Armenian with words like human or people, mm -hmm. rather than to artificially insert gender into the translation and create an exclusionary tone in the English that never existed in the Armenian. To show the shift in tone, when gender is introduced into a translation, I'd like to give a brief example from one of the few Armenian works that has been translated twice into English, albeit once in full and once in selections, and once into French. Here we have a passage from Yesayan's The Gardens of Siligar, with the arguably gender-neutral words Martik and Jorobort. Pierre Ter Sarkisian and I both interpreted the statement Yesayan's father is making in this quote as universal and chose a gender neutral translation for these two words. While Balyozian opted for more gendered language. I'm using this example not to denigrate Balyozian's translation, but to show the kinds of divergent interpretations that translators can bring to their work. Mm -hmm. Now that I've perhaps scared you with the power that <laughs> translators hold in shaping their readers' perceptions, I'd like to conclude by emphasizing the importance of fostering a gender-conscious approach to translation from Armenian, and urge both established and emerging translators to consider projects that shine a spotlight onto the work of Armenian women writers. This anthology is just a sampling of their work, a sampling of an enormous intellectual tradition that has barely been touched by translators. Novels, plays, short stories, poetry, memoirs, nonfiction, you name it, capable and clever Armenian women have written them. And now they wait for a translator to unearth their work and be their ambassador to the English speaking world. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was fantastic. You gave such a generous, I mean, Oh, she can't hear us. Okay, so Jennifer can't hear us, but we want to thank her for her uh, generosity in, um, in sharing some of her, her experience as a translator. And also you too, Model. thank you for sharing your, your experiences as a translator and talking about the specific choices you made and why certain words over others. And thinking here with uh, Jennifer, thinking about those, the gendered way that with Armenian we, we, uh, we shift uh, from a genderless to a gendered language with English. So uh, we're going to go next to our last speaker. And I do want to make sure that everyone uh, just knows that we will just go a little bit over time, just maybe like 10 minutes or so beyond, so that we can have time for questions just in case. So our next speaker, though, is going to be Deanna, uh, Deanna uh, Kachoyan Shantz. And she is pursuing her PhD in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on coalitions among dissident subjects that critique and deterritorialize identity formations in the Armenian and Turkic, Turkish contexts through activism and cultural productions. 
Both her academic and creative collaborations seek to challenge reproductive, normative representations of ethnic belonging and kinship. She orients her work toward alternative queer and feminist assemblages beyond liberal and hyper-individualized frames. In addition to translation, Diana is an avid traveler and postcard writer, having called Yerevan, Venice, and Istanbul home. So let's welcome Diana. Um, so I figured I would try and give you a, a little bit more of a personal expository about the experience of translation and like bring you along with me there. Um, in a response to the question posed by Haiganush Mark's feminist journal, Haigin, about who is more preferable from the perspective of the national revival, the old or the new woman, Vartuhi Kalantar, who I had the crush on, <laughs> still do, <laughs> tersely concludes, quote, revolutions only sh snap dried branches and trim old trees. Whatever has life and is beneficent exists and will remain, and if it too dies, it will regenerate. Today always has a claim over yesterday and tomorrow always on today. While hopeful for change, Kalantar, Kalantar neither celebrates nor claims that the new woman is the woman of her today. Instead, the new woman belongs to tomorrow. She will never have fully been accomplished. She, will, she is always becoming and always to come. As we continue to trace and translate a genealogy of Armenian feminisms to encourage their emergence from censored historical and literary canons, how do we, one, responsibly read and critique them, that is not just blindly recover and praise them, two, question the nationalism that privileges an Armenian subject, asking what its exclusionary boundaries have been throughout various ge geohistorical contexts, that is, who is in and who is out of the Armenian community or of the civilized community at any given time and place. Ergo, and Larna has asked this question um, in her scholarship, what is a feminist versus what is an Armenian feminist? And three, how do we apprehend gendered, racist, and ageist structural oppressions? use this one if you'd like. Um, each other one is, easy. is that better? Okay. So, the other translators have laid out some of the technical challenges and political choices a feminist praxis of translation opens. Now, I would like to anecdotally take you along into that practice's intimate space and suggest how it may raise some broader ethical questions. I would like to consider how that literal movement between languages allows us to think more profoundly about difference and its possibility. The translator's relationship to the work and its production is not just subjective, it is tenuous. As translators, we lure the original outside of its linguistic territory across borders and into a foreign tongue. Then we attempt to bridge the gap between them, an already impossible feat knowing that that bridge is always built imperfectly over shaky ground. The text absorbs us so that we can embody its passions, frustrations, disgust, feel these feelings as our own, and yet fully on its terms, then act as objective mediators between the words, expressions, tone, timbre, and emotions of the original, and translate that into a text that inescapably uses our own words. Our readers experience the text in its future arrival, Benjamin's famous afterlife. The text is again thought anew in this moment. As the agent of this re-territorialization, the translator also and equally speaks the text that she translates. But are all texts worthy of being respoken? For feminism in Armenian, I translated the works of four authors, Yefbime Avadisyan or Anais, Zaruhi Badi, Vartuhi Kalantar and Haiganush Mark over the course of one year as they accompanied me on my circular returns. In Istanbul, I translated Anais and imagined her boat arriving from Buyukada as I sat carelessly sipping tea in Kadikoy, her port of entry. I imagined what the smoke of the steamboat she was sailing on with Mr. Papazian might, must have looked like over the Bosphorus that day 
when flocks of frightened Armenians crowded the docks to leave the city, anticipating massacres during the constitutional reform. What might their clustered footsteps have sounded like over the cobblestones now covered by the pavement I sat over? Could they have imagined it would be possible again for an Armenian to sit freely here in this city? Am I free? What is freedom? Through sheer physical proximity, could I re-summon the pangs of, Zaruhi, the pangs of guilt Zaruhi body must have felt just meters from my walk home in Shishli as she cared for some of the Armenian women who wanted so desperately to abort their babies because they were reminders of their rapes, yet were sedated and forced to give birth by the hospital staff? The Armenian nation couldn't bear to lose more citizens. All were welcome. I guess being half Turkish, or half anything didn't matter so much then. Why is it then that halfy status has often tempered the degrees to which others have measured my Armenianness? Not a full-fledged Armenian, surely, with those blonde hair, with that blonde hair, those blue eyes, that acquired Armenian. Curious how belongings and exclusions change over time. The luxury Four Seasons Hotel in Sultan Ahmed the former central prison of Constantinople. Yesterday's prisoners of the empire, today's neoliberal global tourists. If I stood by the walls of this ex-prison turned hotel, could I still hear the echoes of the women coming from the room of the lepers, their hands beating the wooden floors of their cells like drums, then cupped over their mouths as they circled, eyes wild, making rumbling cries with devilish laughter as they shouted, yalla, yalla, into the air. I'm encircled too by their eyes lined with heavy black eyeliner as they dance their circle dance to celebrate the arrival of the political prisoner Vartuhi Kalantar and her mother. I'm the silent phantom from the future who will speak them into the present. Can these tourists feel as I bring back to life through Kalantar's prison diaries the ghost of Fatma the Arab who right there where they sit each morning eating their simit and unfolding street maps of the city cast her magic love spell over, over Ibrahim, the prison guard. Fatma stood just there 97 years ago to the day, naked beside the blazing fire, her lead-colored body, colored body halfway lit in the midnight darkness, her curly hair lost in the smoke as she called out Bismillah seven times, casting grains of pepper seven by seven into the crackling flames, then extending her arms out towards the door from whence, as if by a miracle, Ibrahim, her love, would come forth. And how I felt filled with excitement, pride, strength, that Haiganush Mark laid bare her idea of the women's cause in Constantinople in the first issues of Haigin as early as 1922. In utter exasperation, and I share this very same gripe, she writes, quote, the word feminist is still completely misunderstood. Thus, it's not in vain that we again explain its meaning. Feminism is a cry for justice which extends to the rights and duties of men and women." End quote. Justice, yes. I pause. And then my fingers, my voice, my emotions, Give life in English to the following words in Anais's 1921 sociological retrospective entitled The Condition of Women in Society. Quote, all the Christian branches of the, the white race can be found where there is civilized society. The argument put forth by this study is that the white race was discovered to have lived thousands of years ago in savage conditions our civilized society has already passed through all the phases which still exist today among the savage and half-civilized races. How to make these words my own, imbibe them objectively to relay them with conviction to my reader and without letting on to my own disgust. Do these words deserve to be rewritten, reread? A far cry from effective embodiment, translation became regurgitation. How to live by what I believe to be the force of feminism, that ongoing cry for justice, and question the naturalness of racism, heteroreproductivity, essentialist assumptions, and thus question any kind of argument or identity built upon violent appropriation or subordination. 
how to build strategies of resistance through translation praxis or the sharing of feminist texts when the texts themselves rest upon racist assumptions, are embedded in structures of oppression and are invested in preserving the nationalized Armenian subject as a white subject of privilege, a privilege that has been passed down to me. How to resist the oft-repeated exoneration, Diana, she's a product of her time. <laughs> the problem is to respond like this is to naturalize bigotry and be blinded to the words, those, be blinded to the wounds those words still inflict today. It is to excuse the premises of slavery, colonialism, or genocide in any given time period. That dismissal speaks from a position of unthreatened power and privilege because it does not see how those legacies still oppress or how, as they often like to remind, Armenians too have suffered at the sword of similar logics. If we are to theorize from practice, and if we are to theorize from prax, uh, practice, then how to situate the translator as she reproduces these colonial models of white, masculine, Christian, Euro-American superiority. My immediate instinct to my own participation in this violent repetition was to ease my tensions by turning to language. I first drafted the black-skinned peoples of Africa, the peoples of Oceania, much more politically correct than black-skinned races, no. Jennifer is correct to point out that had we been translating a century ago, Mart would have been ta taken on the universal gender, men, and a feminist translation can remediate this. I too use this pra uh, practice. However, is it always appropriate? Here, I was sanitizing, erasing, and forgetting. And the words themselves kept insisting, civilized, uncivilized, primitive, half-civilized, white, black-skinned, yellow races, red, brown, they eat their women, those races, tzech, 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 not peoples. Yet if I didn't sanitize, wouldn't I be exposing Anais as a racist? Betraying her? Yes. And that is the goal of my praxis. I parsed this relationship out during the nights and days I sat before that text, swallowing words that have structured my privilege, that violate my politics, yet still have unavoidably inscribed my position. Quote, Among the women of the non-Christian white races residing in Asia, there is no ver veritable ambition to progress. The races that make up half-civilized societies are the following, aside from the Japanese who are quite like-minded to the Europeans, the brown-skinned races of India, the non-Christian races of Asia, the brown-skinned races that live in the northern parts of Africa, and lest we forget, the Peruvian Incas of America and the Aztecs of Mexico. Unlike in Oceania, it is rare that the black-skinned races of Africa are inclined to eat their women. Instead, they give women the most burdensome jobs. Where is our cry for justice? We cannot right away sanitize or explain away, excuse these systemic issues whose branches extend into the politics and power dynamics of today. Anais's text illustrates an inherent ambiguity. She doesn't question the authority of the sociological accounts by white European males that she uses. Instead, she unquestionably bases her study upon their racialized hierarchies to, but to buttress her pro pro progress narrative for gender equality. Equality is relative, not universal. How does that racism latently and overtly persist through the pejorative comments we have all heard at least one Armenian say to another? Always in a whisper. That sev girl, sevamo. What percent Armenian are you? Otare. Perhaps we have even caught ourselves doing it. It is said knowingly and oft times to further instantiate a sense of Armenianness or a sense of kinship and ethnic moral superiority between the exceptional us and the abject them. In their book Kafka, Toward a Minor Literature, Deleuze and Guattari argue that even the most individual enunciation is a particular case of collective enunciation. The subject, the artist, and the virtual community, both of them real, are the components of a collective assemblage. 
If these oppressive power regimes have informed Armenian feminisms, then how do we work on them and how do they work upon us? For me, feminist praxis means that as much as we empower egalitarianism and alliance, we must also be aware of another sometimes hidden or an unconscious reflex to sanitize narratives. Then, we must hold ourselves collectively accountable by actively sitting with and confronting them. In the case of translating Anais, it is meant to make her politics visible and that they screech our ears today so that we are forced to contend with how structures of racism, belonging, and ethnic legitimacy have developed in transnational Armenian discourse through time. The translator plays an important role in revitalizing that manner, and this is certainly not just the case of Armenian feminisms. Just as Kalantar suggests that the present is oriented towards the both past and future, translation functions similarly. Translation is a porous process of dialogue that necess necessitates a conversation between original and target languages, and the translator negotiates between the two to assemble something new. Creating something new means dismantling the hierarchy, or what I've called elsewhere in my translation of Shushan's book, Girkan Bernagir, a pa practice of de-domestication. The original must give up its privileged status as being a significant substance of authority, and the translation and translator must break away from being subjectified to the hierarchical authority of what came before. Only in this way can translation occur. Also, only in this way can it offer itself up for new interpretations and for difference. Translation is not of the original any longer, yet neither is it of the foreign tongue. It is a rebel text, it is a radical text because of its simultaneity, and we can learn something too from this radical practice. Taking the metaphor of a tree to describe the West's oppression, uh, obsession <laughs> and oppression <laughs> with roots, origins and hierarchies in their famous essay Rhizomes, Deleuze and Guattari warn that we shouldn't confuse a retracing of the past or a genealogy as a radical act. To unsilence the past is not enough. The patriarchy is not brought down by simply bringing these voices to the fore. Reactionary, this move still functions within the binary system of silence, unsilence, or in a hierarchy that privileges the authority of the past. That same hierarchy gives authority to voice over silence, men over women, white over black, editors over translators, translators over texts, west over east, fact over fiction. Unsilencing and recovery giving voice are only the first steps. Unlike Deleuze and Guattari, I sit with Foucault generally in maintaining the importance of a genealogical practice. But after mapping that tree, how to start the revolution? How to, as Kalantar says, snap old branches, trim old trees. How to radicalize the roots, to take the past and understand it as actively and simultaneously reforming the present, that our ghosts still haunt us, that racism among, among Armenians still persists, and to see how the trans prefix calls attention to the oppressions of normativity and the structuration of power. There is no beginning or end to this task, no original or copy in this practice. There is alliance and it always has to be reworked. I have been brought in a time capsule to Constantinople of 100 years ago and back. And bringing these pieces into their afterlife reinvigorates me to continue asking the same questions. How have models of belonging, nationalism and feminism buttressed their legitimacy upon the exclusion of others, the Turk, the primitive savage, the non-Armenian, and imperialist liberal models of progress, capitalist modes of ownership, and east-west hierarchies. In what ways might these texts and our very collaboration go beyond those exclusions or not? How does our own group of Armenian-identified feminist women working on these heritage texts also hold this tension? To what extent is our group also, in Jasper Puar's words, trapped within the logics of identity when I strive through feminist and queer praxis in my own work to destabilize identities by decentering the narrative that follows the I am dot dot dot? Who is this we? Who are women? 
What has at any given time determined the condition under which people uh, claim Armenian identity? And what are the conditions under which some have been excluded from that identity? The language they spoke, their historical, geographic, cultural, sexual conditions under which they lived. If we think of we as already having arrived instead of a constant becoming, then we will have already fixed, stagnated, and stunting that, stunted that belonging. That border constantly needs to be critically challenged. That belonging always needs to expand if it is to make coalitional and livable. I do not pretend to have transcended or answered any of these questions, but merely wish to point out to another line of inquiry I think feminist praxis can accomplish and must attend to as we continue to write a genealogy of Armenian feminist literature and our coalitional politics. So, knowing that they harm, should these words be respoken? The black races, and not the African peoples, perhaps. It was painful to translate Anais's texts. I felt a traitor because as a translator in this project of feminist collaborators, I sensed the unspoken, time-honored, self-inflicted pressure of being the loyal daughter introducing her foremothers to the English-speaking world. This is the inevitable tension between latent nationalist pride and queer feminist praxis. Choosing the latter, I hope this unsanitized translation recovers a mode of discourse to be challenged through critical historiography. This praxis offers much more insight into history and the production of knowledge. That ear-screeching racism should stop us in our tracks. It should scream out to all of us, resist. <coughs> today always has a claim over yesterday and tomorrow always on today. I read Kalantar's vision of the new woman as the woman always to come as a prescient possible iteration of this revolution if we are radical enough to try to arrive. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you again to all our panelists for their really provocative talks. Uh, and thanks for that call to action at the very end. Just resist. Resist that allure, <laughs> allure of the original. Um, so it's interesting. So we're going to take some questions, and we have a question right up front. And please state your name before <coughs> you say the question. Can I, uh, sorry to interrupt. Shushan apologized. She had to go and feed Zora. Okay. That's why she won't be able to like stay uh, to question and answer session. But Jennifer will be with us shortly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. We can start with you. Uh, my name is Anish Tertanian. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to bring up the issue of um, the translation language that isn't there. For instance, I don't call Armenians the minority. I call them the conquered indigenous majority. And I think that that gives a better sense because whenever they speak of Armenians, they never mention that they are the indigenous people. And, and that Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would help if you stood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Anush Tertalian, and I have decided to include words about Armenians that are not there, because so many times when they describe us, they describe us as the minority in Turkey, and I think this is totally misleading. I feel we are the indigenous conquered majority, and this gives a better sense of um, you know, uh, what happened to us. Because, and then also, um, in terms of uh, this whole thing of um, being queer, I think, in the LGBT community, the L, the lesbian, has been um, diluted and um, suppressed by a, a queer movement. And um, also there is the question of language <coughs> describing Armenians. I describe it as light-skinned people of color. So I have been invited by the Women of Color Solidarity Conference that's happening in New York on April 14th to give a workshop on being an indigenous, light-skinned Armenian woman. So um, actually, your question, it seems to be about the importance of the words we use to describe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're suggesting we create a new vocabulary for... Mm -hmm. So maybe we could have our panelists uh, just comment on that, talking about the new vocabulary that we can create as translators. 
if you're if anyone's interested in taking well, maybe it. I'll just say quickly that there's one thing about creating a new vocabulary and then working with already what's there mm -hmm. before you so I mean and as in general as in a translation practice you do have to you can't make up the words that you wish were mm -hmm. there you have to in some way you know stick with what's there so I don't know uh, Model. Yeah, like I, you I, have something to yeah. I think your your experience of preserving, making sure that you preserve what was there in the in the original of the that racist language that was being used, um, I think is you're right. It's not about creating a new language to recover someone who had used that kind of language in the original and kind of sanitize her, uh, make her palatable to us. Uh, so it's not about maybe in that way. It's not creating a new language to talk about what wasn't there. Um, any other questions up in the audience? Yes, there's a question in the back. So please state your name first. Uh, I'm one Miss Kulichta, uh, visiting scholar at CMES Harvard. First of all, let me thank all the panelists for this very tempting and exciting uh, presentations. And my question will be for Maral. Uh, it's very interesting to formulate translator as a server. And as you say, it's a political term talking from a political framework. So therefore, it immediately, immediately calls for power relations between ruler and group. I mean, being a sovereign makes sense if you have first a territory and a second a population to rule or to govern. So how can you define this power relation in this endeavor of translation? I mean, who is the ruler here and who is the rule? And secondly, and the second concept related to power relations is the accountability. I mean, different type of sovereignties have different type of accountabilities. If you, if this is a Leviathan type of accountability, there will be limited, uh, uh, limited accountability, if any. On the other hand, if this is a more democratic kind of sovereignty, there will be a broader accountability. So how do you define the accountability of translator here? I mean, and how does it work? And to whom? I mean, maybe it's not fair to discuss all this in a set two sentences, but yeah. just some questions. Yeah, thank you for your question on this, because that's what actually I try to really describe and try to establish that relationship and in order to understand the translation, as always said, it's, it's, as I said, it's not something new, but it's really political, so maybe we can just try to see every sort of translational moment and that certain potentials that any, any means of potentials that the translator can engage himself with can turn into a power relationship, a manifestation power over the subject and sometimes over the original order itself. So at one point, we see that Leviathan type of power relationship comes forward through the standard translations that are mentioned or the biased translators who just kind of reduces the text into something else in order to, for the sake of smoothening, domesticating uh, for the target readership. So that can be uh, kind of likened to uh, Leviathan uh, sort of um, sovereignty. And at the other end, we, we have to, I mean, this is how I think, and this is why I approach to translation study, and especially feminist translation studies uh, within this perspective, because we really have to be careful about that distinction. It doesn't end with the biased translator. We, as liberating kind of actors of translation studies have to be careful about our text because it's always there. I mean, you can, in every moment, as I try to summarize, through the text, through the application of it, and through the whole uh, entire picture of it, like all of us becoming sovereign figures here and uh, talking our ideas through this text, engage ourselves through this text, we all have this danger to, um, either kind of continue with that sort of sovereignty and you know force our texts into a certain position and that's why i said intentionally or unintentionally 
uh, we can just direct it at certain point to some direction and kind of risk the text, risk to convey the, the original message of the texts and how they uh, are female Armenian feminists try to give and how it differed in our texts. This is, this is really uh, a potential danger for all of us. So we have to be careful with every decision. And that's why I'm just really uh, quite attentive about these terms, care, taking care of the text, and making decisions. These are really uh, two means that really makes us as, I don't want to say particularly biopolitical, but political figures, political agencies, who inevitably uh, are engaged with the texts, with the, this sort of literature through translation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great, thank you. So we have, uh, this might be our final question, and Judy, go ahead. I'm Judy Sarrison again, and thank you very much for a, a really fascinating panel discussion. I'm just I'm thrilled that you you know you entered in such deep understanding <coughs> explanation of, of your process. So what I wanted to ask uh, Diana, um, I'm very interested in how Armenian uh, feminists uh, viewed the other, and so you talked about that in two specific cases. One was with Vartu Kalantar and how she. Uh, Experienced the prison in Istanbul and, and was describing, you know, uh, women of different ethnicities at the prison. And then you described um, Anais and, and how she was experiencing the other in her writing. I wanted to get maybe a little more from you about uh, Bartuli and Kalantar. Um, what was your sense when she was describing the different uh, groups, the ethnic groups within the prison, in terms of her view of, of them? You didn't really go into so much. Uh, so much detail about that. Can you, you know, about go into a little more? Just how how she um, how she experienced her relationships, her interaction. Because at this time, you know, this was around what uh, 1914 in in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople. At this time, groups, the Armenians were not interacting so much with other, you know, ethnic groups within the empire. I mean, there were some interactions, but here she was in the prison. So she was obviously interacting. I just wanted to understand her, um, how she described people. In the, was there anything that, you, that struck you as particularly, um, you know, was it was it racist or not racist? No, I mean, how was her, her uh, um, language was used? No, was I the language yeah. very. Um, I think that actually the examples that Maral brought up in her presentation were like a good indication of, of some of what you're asking. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, everybody, we can like trace it. It's a whole history, I guess, of looking about how anyone at any given time period and I, groups are identifying with the other. Um, but I think the examples that Maral uh, showed, I mean, she, when she refers to different women in the prison, um, usually it's like you know Fatma the Arab, Sinem the Kurd. Um, who else is there? Feride, Feride, the, the, refugee. the the refugee. Who's the Atia the Persian? Um, honestly, I mean beyond that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, of course, I think that you. I mean, yeah, maybe Larna, you wanna say you could say something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe I should hear at that at at certain level, I just started reading Kalantar's kind of interpretation as fictionalizing them, as describing mm -hmm. them, yeah. as Characters. putting a certain othering process. But at certain moments, as I just gave those examples, the uh, in Armeno Turkish, she includes her, their their kind of expressions, Turkish expressions, by mm -hmm. using Armenian letters. This is a kind of hospitality offering mm -hmm. to the other. So this, this is one of the gestures. And also those two sentences that are included, and in, they, they really talk to each other in a very meaningful way. Matmazel, maman geldi. Matmazel, your mother is here. And that, they, that very word shows that the Turk the, or the Kurd Kurdish woman, prisoner. So you, these are mm -hmm. three different kind of aspects of of yeah. the other women yeah. uh, against the Armenians. So that, that certain mutual recognition comes mm -hmm. to language and 
Kalantar, without really imposing on these kind of gestures, linguistic gestures, she carries it into her own text. Mm -hmm. And then comes Yavrus, because uh, her mother says to her daughter, Kalantar, Yavrus, and Yavru is a Turkish word yeah. originally. So these languages through these feminist writers writing about their own lives in prison because it's an you know enclosed mm -hmm. exclusionary space that again comes mm -hmm. as a meaningful kind of aspect mm -hmm. of that of that arrangement <laughs> of organizations of life. So in one respect, I think Kalantar is kind of copying or fictionalizing that Ottoman texture through the prisoner, prisoner society, and then she doesn't really seem to forget about, you know, um, replacing or healing that othering process mm -hmm. through certain dynamics or strategies, like the like mm -hmm. the example I gave you. Yeah, yeah. but I think, and just also to mm -hmm. add that I think, like, there is a difference. And so, what I wanted to point out, for example, mm -hmm. in the the piece, the, some of the pieces that I shared of, of some of the Anais texts with you, that there is a very distinct like difference also between um, like again the, some of the examples that I gave you, which is very clearly built on a kind of like racial understanding of um, you know of uh, of privilege and status as a citizen and being in the civilized world, and then community identity markers that happen historically throughout any given period of time. And I think those are, and, and we can see that quite clearly also and, and, mm -hmm. and analyze them accordingly. Yeah. Okay, so thanks again to the audience. That was our last question. And, and thank you. So let's all.